observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. As many of you know, or maybe you don't, the Sundance Film Festival has, well, it's kicked off to a roaring start. This year it's all virtual, which means you don't have to be in Park City, Utah to watch these films. Uh, there's a much wider net that is being cast. More people can see the movies. There's a lot of really interesting films this year coming from a lot of very interesting uh, filmmakers. It's always exciting. I, I, I'm a huge film festival fan. I started going to film festivals. I think the first time I went to a film festival, I was 12. And it was SIF, the Seattle International Film Festival. And the first movie I ever saw at a film festival was The Empire Strikes Back. That's right. SIF had a special advanced showing of Empire. Uh, they showed it. It was at night, at midnight, 3, 6, and 9 a.m. And my parents would not let me go, a 12-year-old, to downtown Seattle to stand in line overnight to see The Empire Strikes Back. So I had to settle for the 9 a.m. showing, but that was okay. Uh, I got on a bus dressed as a miniature Darth Vader and took uh, two buses to downtown Seattle, got in line at the UA-150, my beloved UA-150, and that was the first of 26 screenings I had of The Empire Strikes Back at that theater. And it was uh, very exciting, but that was my first experience with a film festival, and uh, I went to, to the Seattle Film Festival for the next eight years, and I became a full series pass holder uh, in 84 at the ninth Seattle International Film Festival. I think I saw 160 movies in a month, and it was amazing. Uh, it really broadened my horizons and showed me what was possible in terms of what cinema around the world was like. So I've, I've been a huge fan of film festivals ever since. Um, I've been to many uh, as a filmmaker with things like Free Enterprise or The Hills Run Red or even films I've edited like James Boyd's The New Gods. His uh, My producer on The New Gods actually started the Slamdance Film Festival. And so I've never actually been to Utah. I've never gone to Sundance, unfortunately. I always, I always waited. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to go until I have a film there. Luckily, this year, I have a film, of course, you all know, um, <laughs> Tango Shalom, which is playing. We keep getting into more film festivals. I can announce that the film has also recently been admitted to the Garden State Film Festival in New Jersey. We're an official selection there, which is nice because it's not a Jewish film festival. And Tango Shalom obviously has great appeal uh to Jewish film festivals, but but you don't get enough eyeballs, I think. Hopefully with, with the, that will change because they're all virtual, and Tango Shalom will be playing uh, next month, of course, at the San Diego International Jewish Film Festival and the Charlotte Jewish Film Festival. So if you live in and around either San Diego or Charlotte, you can see our film Tango Shalom. As you know, I produced the film, I edited the film, I was the post-production and visual effects supervisor on the film as well. Uh, so you can go there, and we're playing uh, at a number of other cities, and when they announce their lineups, I will be able to tell you uh, more about seeing Tango Shalom. So, uh, although I, I, I will say it's a little bittersweet, because I love going to film festivals, Um Going to film festivals and hanging out and meeting other film festivals. I've mentioned before, my favorite film festival in all the world is the Sitges Film Festival in Sitges, Spain, which is just about, about 20 kilometers south of Barcelona, Barcelona, on the Mediterranean. And it's my favorite film festival because, well, one, not only uh, is it in Spain on the Mediterranean, but it's a film festival that's all about science fiction, fantasy, and horror movies. And as a, as a, um, perhaps as, as a business decision, it's not necessarily, uh, the festival you want to go to if you're, if you're interested in selling your movie, but there is not a better film festival in my mind to go in terms of audiences that are my people. Angel Sala, who's one of the festival directors is a terrific guy. I've been there a number of times. Free Enterprise had its world premiere there. The Hills Run Red played there. We took a limo with Herschel Gordon Lewis, the godfather, the wizard of gore, to our film. You never know who you're going to meet in Sigis. Femme Fatale's episodes played 
in Sigis. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's just an incredible festival. The milieu is great. The people are great. The food is great. You're in Spain. And there's always great stories that come out of that film festival that I will refrain from sharing on this show. But suffice to say, film festivals are a favorite thing of mine. But what's very interesting about Sundance is, I think all the way back to, well, the explosion the, the explosion of independent, uh, the new American independent cinema that began in the 80s and early 90s, where we saw people like Spike Lee and Steven Soderbergh and, of course, Kevin Smith and Quentin Tarantino, uh, the people that became the mainstays of American indie cinema and, and in some cases, cinema in general, studio projects, things like that. Uh, Sundance has always been kind of ground zero for the worldwide independent cinema now. Of course, things have changed. Independent cinema is no longer Kevin Smith making clerks for uh, 30 or 40 grand on, on, borrowed, on borrowed money with his credit cards. Now, what, what, what indie cinema is, is sort of uh, well-funded independent cinema that has that has well is it really indie anymore i don't i don't know and usually now you're seeing a lot more because independent movies like everything else it's become a highly competitive market and independent cinemas are base independent cinema is basically non studio cinema but that doesn't necessarily mean it's embodying the spirit of independent cinema although it still does that as well but really you can sort of gauge a lot of the new talent that you see coming uh, up uh, makes it to Sundance. Sundance is a very difficult festival to get into, and nowadays, most of the films that get into Sundance have a little bit of help, but some don't. Some fall through the cracks. But what's really interesting to me about what the state of independent cinema is, you can sort of gauge where we were at by seeing who acquires what films at Sundance, how much they pay for them, and uh, what what we can look forward to seeing on on our our uh, streaming services because a lot of look a lot of these movies are never going to make it into movie theaters the way they say used to just because that business has changed obviously forget covid but but the problem with movies now on a studio level is the marketing costs you can acquire a movie for uh, a lot of money as we will talk about in just a moment but then you still have to market the film if you're going to put it in theaters, market it, and it's got to be marketed globally. So one of the great things about our new world that we live in, the new universe of of streamers, is that a lot of streaming services are acquiring movies that would no longer see a projector bulb because there's just nobody who's going to pick them up. I mean, look, there are still some amazing indie film distributors out there. My beloved A24, for instance, and their taste in horror. Uh, Annapurna, although they've partnered up with people, you've still got places like Samuel Goldwyn. There's plenty of places that still acquire independent movies, but now we've got streamers. And the great thing about streamers is they've got the kind of money to acquire independent movies and basically make independent filmmakers whole by what they're paying. And what I mean by that is, you know, usually independent movies are still borrowed, that you make them with borrowed money from many different sources. Sometimes you might have. I don't know, 10 financiers. You'll notice a lot of independent films have multiple uh, company logos on the beginning. Usually those logos are there because some way or somehow they've either acquired money for these movies to get made, they were able to place talent, or for whatever reason they brought something, a major component together uh, that came together to help make that film. So that's why they get their company logos on the front of movies. But it's still, look, it's tough racket. It's hard to make money. So if you're making, you know, independent movies, Blumhouse has an incredible model. Five most of their movies are made for five million dollars or less. If you're N Night Shyamalan, you still have to start over. Like uh, the visit again worked in that model, and it turns out great. So then Blumhouse is like, okay, we don't. Uh, this turned out fantastic. We can either put it in theaters or give it to Universal to distribute or some such thing, and hopefully make a lot of money. But if not, if it doesn't work out as well as they'd hope, Blumhouse can always place it with a streaming service or Shutter or something, and and it'll find its audience that way. But um, you know, th there's 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 many different models now. But I am uh, I am excited about what streamers, meaning Netflix, Apple, Amazon, mean to independent filmmaking, because if something some a company that has deep pockets such as Apple, Amazon 
or or even to a certain extent now Netflix with their cash flow, they can come in and they make it possible. So for me, look, and I think for any independent filmmaker, don't get me wrong, we always dream of of getting rich. But when you're making an independent movie, usually the subject matter sort of precludes <laughs> that uh, you don't, you're not going to make a lot of money usually with independent cinema simply because the subject matter is not going to usually appeal to somebody the way, say, an endgame does. Sometimes you will appeal to people and you do score big uh, on the independent film festival circuit. Well, let's see what happened. Something happened at uh, at Sundance Film Festival. A record-setting acquisition happened uh, Apple lands the film Coda for a $25 million record-setting worldwide deal. First major virtual 2021 Sundance Film Festival sale. So uh, Apple is roaring out of the gate, acquiring this movie Coda for $25 million. Now, I don't know how much this movie cost to make, but venturing a guess, I would say it probably cost a lot less than $25 million to make. And my rule of thumb is always if you're borrowing money to make a film, what you want to do is give your investors back 30% on their mo- on on their the money, which means that if they loan you $100, you want to be able to give them $130 back, preferably within a 24-month period of time. Uh, that would be I would rather have it be 18 months, but you still have to make the movie, finish the movie and get it out there. So, Basically, if you're borrowing money, what I try and do if I'm getting private equity is say, look, I need to borrow this much money. I want to borrow it for 24 months. And hopefully at the end of 24 months, you will get your money back, your initial investment plus 30%. Um, Can I guarantee that? Certainly not. But that's what I'm shooting for whenever I personally am trying to borrow money for independent film projects. So $25 million is a huge amount of money to spend for an independent movie. But we now live in a world where if Apple buys that and they, they buy worldwide rights, unless there's some kind of uh, clause where the, the ownership of the negative goes back to the original filmmakers or the original producers after a certain amount of time, Apple's bought this movie forever. They've, they've, they've taken it off the filmmaker's hands. And what's terrific about that for a filmmaker is, I would imagine you get to pay all your investors back, you get to put a little chunk of change in your pocket, and you know your film is going to be seen in perpetuity pretty much forever throughout the universe, which is probably the best way for an independent film to wind up. Uh, Let me just read this. Mike Fleming posted this at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, Exclusive. This is from Deadline. In the first big deal of the 2021 virtual Sundance Film Festival, Apple has landed worldwide rights to CODA, for a number just north of 25 million. That sets a new Sundance acquisitions record above the 22.5 million that Palm Springs received last year from Hulu Neon. But this time, all the premiere watching and all night auctioning was done far from the slopes of Park City. It came down to a pitched battle between Apple and Amazon. Writer director Sean Heater's coming of age drama is about a high school senior who is the only hearing person in her deaf family and is torn between holding together that unit or seeking her own dreams. The film premiered opening night in the U.S. dramatic competition, and buyers loved it. It became clear yesterday that its value to distributors was heading into the stratosphere after receiving glowing reviews and reaction from buyers. Multiple offers were on the table and brought the bidding close to close to Palm Springs territory. That was the Andy Samberg, Christian... Uh, Milody movie that broke Sundance sales records last year with $22.5 million. The film, the title's acronym is for Child of Deaf Adults, centers on Ruby, Amelia Jones, the only hearing person in her deaf family. When the family's fishing business is threatened, she finds herself torn between pursuing her love of music and her fear of abandoning her parents. The pick is based on the award-winning French hit La Famille Bellier, Jones is a real discovery, and the film is a bona fide crowd pleaser with heart and awards potential. Heater has captured the fishing scene in Boston and the love of classic Motown and Joni Mitchell and Marvin Gaye, whose songs are broken down and connect you to the message within them and why they resonate with the characters navigating difficult circumstances. Most importantly, it creates a real way into the world of the mother, father, and son who are born deaf, and when the film transports the audience to how these deaf characters experience the world without sound and try and appreciate the bright singing talent of a cherished daughter they can't hear, the results are what they build 
Best Picture candidates out of. Numerous buyers discussed the film with me yesterday and were saddened when the numbers shot past what they could spend on it as it became clear this would be a world rights deal with a streamer. Deal was led for Apple by heads of Worldwide Video, Zach Van Amberg and Jamie Ehrlich, who last year reeled in the Sundance doco Boys State, which is in the Oscar race right now. It becomes the latest statement-making deal for Apple, which at the last virtual can broke the record there for the Anton Fuqua Will Smith runaway slave drama Emancipation in a record pre-buy. Said writer-director Heater, I've been so moved by the outpouring of response to the film and I'm so excited to have found a partner in Apple that loves and deeply gets the movie. The spirit in which it was created and is committed to having the film we reach the widest possible audience possible in a thoughtful and meaningful way. The whole CODA team is also so grateful to Sundance for being a part of the film's journey. I hope that this film and Apple's powerful support will help kick down some doors standing in the way of inclusion and representation and pave a path for more stories that center uh, characters from the deaf and disabled community. The world has waited too long for these stories to be told. Now is the time. No more excuses. Eugenio Derbez, Marley Matlin, and Ferdia Walsh Pelio also star. Uh, Fabrice Gianfermi, the Pathé film, was produced by Philip Rousselot, or Rousselet, pardon me, and Patrick Waksberg, and produced the film with Jerome Sadu, and exec produced by Artivan Safi, Sarah Borsch Jacobson, and co produced by Hester Hargett Appetit, <laughs> Ged Dickerson, Marie de Senival, and Eric Gelman. Stephanie Cal, I can't even, you know, I can't even pronounce all these names, but the article is deadline. The auction was brokered by CAA Media Finance and ICM Partners and Pathé. Uh, all of this bodes well for the hot titles in the festival with the Rebecca Hall directed Passing premiering today. Now, you will notice this movie was represented by CAA. It was made by Pathé, and it was a remake of a known French commodity. So, admittedly, there's a lot of heavy hitters behind this movie making sure that it has the success that it had. But still, uh, as you as you could probably tell, this might have been a big studio movie in the 80s. It would have been the kind of, of movie a studio would have made as Oscar bait. Maybe it would have followed up Children of a Lesser God or something like that. But nowadays... Movies like this are just not, they're, they're not what studios are going to acquire. They're not what studios are going to pick up. So the fact that they're still getting made, companies like Pathé and the fact that it's a remake of a known film, you can look at that film and go, okay, we'll invest in this movie. We'll do an American remake of this movie. There's a lot of that that happens. There's a lot of, of a, a lot of our movies. Homeland, for instance, was a remake of an Israeli television show, the Claire Dane Showtime series. Uh, these are things that, I mean, they're already known commodities, so they're risk-averse in the first place. But still, $25 million for a film of this kind proves to me, it says to me that, well, there's a lot of healthiness going on in the film business. And I think the great work does, I do believe, in the meritocracy of great work. And if you've done some really great filmmaking, it's going to get out there. People are going to see it. And sure, do I dream of, of seeing Tango Shalom get, get acquired by somebody for enough money where we can pay back our investors that 30%? Certainly hope so. But uh, And I can, I can dare to dream. We'll see. Our first film festival brought us an award, but we'll see what the others have in store. But all I can tell you is that if you want to see our film, it's going to be playing around you. It's going to be playing in two festivals in Canada so far. It's already played in India. But this makes me... Uh, every time every time there's an epic win with a streamer picking up an independent film, despite the fact that CAA represents it, although uh, John Levin, our sales representative, used to be a senior vice president at CAA, so you do what you can. But anyway, I think that um, it's always exciting. when. It, and by the way, this movie, this idea appeals to me. And while I believe, look, I believe every movie should be seen in a theater, I think seeing a film on a big screen with a big sound system, uh, it, it benefits any movie, no matter what it is. I really honestly believe that. I like to see films on the big screen. But that said, as we have bigger and bigger TVs uh, in the home, uh, I think always a good thing. Things are changing. The world is changing. And we um, uh, it, it's still nice to see this kind of success. And I, I think it bodes well... Like the director said, like uh, Director Heater said, 
These are the kind of stories, I mean, people are getting out there and they're telling these kinds of stories. That's why, you know, real diversity is about the voices and the experiences of people being um, shared. It's not just about the color of people's skin. It's nice to populate your stories with people, but what you really want is you want to hear their stories, their experiences. And if you're going to tell a story that has diversity or talks about what is it, what does it mean to be disabled in the world today? Can you say disabled or should we say hearing challenged? Whatever. Um, it's it's these are the kinds of stories that I want to hear. What a great way into this idea. I, I mean, I heard this log line. Uh, a, a girl that is not deaf who is born into a deaf family who wants to pursue her musical dreams, but yet does she do that and leave her family behind? To me, that's an irresistible story. Can't wait to see this movie. Very excited to see what comes out of Sundance. Uh, I have to say, to me, like with John Campia, I love the Oscars, but I really love I love the Sundance time of year. I mean, yes, yeah, sure, most of the time, not a, not a lot of the movies that come out of Sundance appeal to me, but then again, there's always something that comes out of Sundance that I'm always waiting to see, and this goes to number one with the bullet, and I'm very excited about this. I'm also very excited that Apple would pay $25 million for this kind of a story because that means that, I mean, look, making movies is still very, very hard. Making a movie that's this good or the way it affects people as much as this one does, that's tough to do. Tough to do. So there is still, you still have to be a talented filmmaker, but when you are, it's nice to know that there is the possibility of getting this kind of a return and getting it on a, on a streaming service like Apple, most importantly, means the movie that you've toiled on for however long you've toiled on it is going to be seen. It'll be there. People will constantly discover it for years to come. And um, boy, did that excite me. So very excited, very excited about this one. So yeah, that's what I want to talk about. Kind of a little, little good news for you independent film fans out there. Clearly another movie, again, getting another great film to watch is always, it's always what we want, isn't it? 